This ship chat is brought to you by my members. If you want to support the channel and see some exclusive artwork, then you can join, then you can join at the Centurion tier. Thank you very much. Right, today we're going to be talking about a ship that I have named the Raven class. It's called something else by its um, creator, which I'm not going to try to pronounce. It's an awkward name. It's it's one of these things you always fall into with Romulan ships of various forms of impronounceable nonsense, and it's like I'll just call it the Raven. It's a Raven. It's a it's a it, it, and it makes sense for what it is, um, which we'll get into. But it was created by Soren seventy seven. This is from uh, Trek BBS, which is still up. You can find it. Uh, there'll be a link to it. It's very obviously a design inspired by a combination of the Romulan Scout and also actually. I think the Romulan Bird of Prey from, Ent from Enterprise, certainly those nacelles, remind me a lot of that Bird of Prey. Now, it has a different lore from what I've come up with. I think mine fits better, but it's still interesting. So basically, these things were built super quickly after Praxis, and they were designed to be cheap and numerous attack craft. Uh, now, actually, they're not really that small or that numerous, you will, as we'll see. Personally, I think a ship like this in that period is kind of redundant when you have all the faster designs, when you have stuff like uh, Gallant Wing and and uh, Wings of Vengeance and the, the White Wind. It's an unnecessary design in, in that respect, but it's a nice design and that's why I included it, but included it as a Lost Era ship. And then you kind of end up more closely connecting it with the uh, Romulan Scout which obviously inspired it, but in universe it'll probably be the other way around. Anyway, so let's get into it in universe. It was developed after the Tomed incident, and it was developed as part of a new fleet doctrine. We'll cover this Romulan fleet doctrine, this elusive Romulan fleet doctrine eventually, but it was developed by Keskachar Engineering, who developed all the Birds of Prey. You can see a lot of that DNA in there. Now, Unlike Birds of Prey, which put a lot of emphasis on firepower, on their ability to, to take out targets quickly, this actually puts far more emphasis on intelligence gathering and reconnaissance. But it's no longer in the purview of these smaller craft to, you know, go out and do hunting enemy vessels. It's actually much more in their purview to do intelligence gathering. That's an important thing. So that's really what it was developed to. And in order to aid it in undertaking that mission, it has a couple of interesting um, additions or evolutions from the previous generation of birds of prey, so to speak. Uh, it has a next generation cloaking device. This in itself is aided by the uh, new paint, which they've covered their holes with or, or alloy. This new alloy helps conceal the thermal emissions, the thermal signature of the hull. So it's very useful for, you know, aiding in stealth. So in terms of Birds of Prey, there's a couple of bits of comparison. First is to point out that this is actually, it looks like a small ship. It isn't. It's actually about 303 meters long. It's a good size ship for its for its day, even, even at that point. It's, it's a decent size, and that's partially reflective that it's got to have a decent amount of range. Uh, and also, we're not quite, you know, at the miniaturization of, you know, other stuff. This is a ship that will later be replaced by the Scout, but they haven't quite figured out how to get that technology into a smaller platform yet, so that, which is why we have something that is 300 meters long. Its armament is very light. It has four disruptor cannons and a torpedo tube in the front. That's it. That is, that is the armament. So you can very clearly see this is not intended to fight. This is intended to scout. This is intended to do reconnaissance and spying and be sneaky and stealthy. These weapons are only really there for self-defense to allow it to quickly get away and protect itself in the process. Uh, we've got a much, much sleeker build compared to previous generations of Bird of Prey. The engines are actually proportionally bigger compared to a lot of the Birds of Prey. These are very large engines. They take up about half the overall length of the ship. Uh, and these are new engines as well. These are, they are a new style of tapering nacelle. Now, the fact, so basically what you have is, you have your sort of Boussard ram scoop at the front or your, your 
you know, fuel reserve, which is going to be at the front. And then tapering back, you have slowly, slowly smaller and smaller warp coils working towards the back. So the warp coils take per from very large to very small. That is a very energy efficient design. It's very good, at, again, at concealing it and, and being efficient. You, you absorb a lot of the excess energy in that kind of design. Now, it does mean that you have less available power for your warp nacelles. You can't make them go as hard as something that is essentially a, a square nacelle. That's obviously going to have a whole lot more power to it. Uh, but like I say, it's good for stealth. It creates less disruption. It's partially why we'll see similar kinds of tapering nacelles on the Enterprise-E, although that's to avoid disrupting subspace and causing further damage to that. They, the Romulans weren't, you know, ahead of the curve on that. They, would, they didn't care about that. They were just using it to improve its stealth performance and meant that it could travel at a decent speed at warp while under cloak and not be detected because that was a big thing was that their, their cloaking devices were good during the Tomed incident, but they were far from undetectable. And so this is kind of part of that exercise of getting the cloak to a point where you are almost in, completely in, in, invisible unless you mess up. Oh yeah, and another point to uh, get across is that it's still running on a compression drive. That's again partially why it's so big. It needs to carry all the fuel for a long-range mission, and it's still running on an antimatter compression drive which is a very fuel intense system. So again, that's probably where some of the bulk of the of the Raven really went to was you know, just fuel provisions for long distance travel. It also has at the back, you can see, of course, two impulse units. So it's decently maneuverable at sublight, which is rare for a Romulan ship of this of of this era. Increasingly, the Romulans cared less and less about sublight maneuverability, especially for their bigger ships. Now, if you're taking into context of when this is, this is among the this is one of the smaller designs, but it's still proportionally got larger impulse units than the uh, the two other ships of this era. So it was fast. It was a very very quick ship, and that in tandem with its cloak meant that it was very elusive. There's not really much to say about weapons, but there is to say about its other weapons, its sensors. So, on the prow array, you have a multi-spectral sensor array. This is all your basic stuff, senses, various spectra of visible light and electromagnetic radiation. You then have a dorsal lateral array, which detects electromagnetic fields. So it's good for detecting cloaked ships, other cloaked ships, and other sorts of uh, strange, strange energy fields. Uh, you then have an aft gravitic sensor, which is again to counter cloak. It also helps the ship navigate while under its own cloaking device so that you can, without using active sensors, still detect, again, things in proximity. It's also very useful for mapping out star systems and, you know, planets and orbits and things like that. You then have a ventral lateral array, which houses the subspace communications. That's basically to encode and, and transmit your own communications and also to jam and intercept the enemy communications and then give you a little bit of an insight as to what they are up to. Finally, you then have the deflector dish, which is a variable hard point. You could use it properly for any one of these things, but it's generally used as a telescopic sensor array. So being able to look at something, the next star system over, that's often what it's used. That's also why the deflector is segmented in two so that you can still have half the deflector working as a navigational deflector and the other half being used as an additional sensor array. Obviously, if you're going full warp drive, you need both plates active. Now, in terms of its career, the Raven entered service in the 2320s, and it was involved in a lot of recon, and was very, very, very well liked by the sort of newly formed Tal Shiar. They really liked this ship because it was very good for reconnaissance, it was quick for its day, it was stealthy, it was good not only as a uh, expeditionary recon force, but it was also very good police craft as well. So it had a little bit of both going on, and so in some ways made it a little bit controversial among the rest of the Romulan population. You know, it kind of became a little bit tarnished by its association with the Tal Shiar. 
It did have some skirmishes with the Klingons, particularly once the Boreth class entered service, and basically that was it. The, one of the main things the Boreth did was run these things off. Um, yeah, and basically any time it was engaged, it ran. It ran because you've only got two disruptor cannons and a torpedo launcher, and against dedicated warships, this is not a warship, this is a spy ship, and I think that's really worth emphasizing this is a spy ship not a warship and they knew it so that they would run and a point in its favor is that normally it could get away from a boreth and that's that's pretty impressive the boreth is a fast ship very very the boreth is very very fast and so to be able to escape it you know demonstrates just how elusive the raven really could be now of course in the in the 50s the modular scouting platform came in, which was kind of derived, it was a Keska Char design obviously, but it was basically derived from their experience of building and designing the Raven. And it's basically everything the Raven can do, but in a smaller, more modular package. So unfortunately for the Raven, it was somewhat phased out in favour of the smaller modular scout platform. However, there was also another variant of it designed in the 50s and 60s. One of the problems the Raven also ran into is they were introducing the new D Duradex Warbirds, which would run exclusively on artificial quantum singularities, which meant that the kind of operational scope of the Empire changed overnight, and antimatter driven ships were on the chopping block. Now, for other classes like the Daniel, the Nova, and the Firehawk, there wasn't really much saving, but Keska Char decided they would develop a smaller variant, a half-sized variant of the uh, Raven, you know, still could be used as a reconnaissance platform, and that was about, 100 and, uh, about 160 metres long. It was still larger than the, than the Scouts which replaced it, and it was still kind of very much intended as a, a reconnaissance asset rather than a, than a fighting vessel, but it still could see use attached to, again, de Duradex flotillas, and then it could dock under the wings of a Dedurodex, and then, you know, fly off and do additional reconnaissance and greatly improve the situational awareness of a Dedurodex flotilla, or indeed a Gemini or Cortari. So, it did actually see use in that respect. In the Dominion War, it was used famously by Tomalok's Black Legion, again, largely in a reconnaissance role, and in that role, it did very well. It obviously had updated and and miniaturized technology built into it but it was still a very capable uh, reconnaissance platform although not quite as fast and uh, elusive as it was back in its day but still very very good as a as a reconnaissance platform to summarize that I, people don't really know about the the raven class and that's kind of by design it was a ship that went unnoticed and it was designed to go unnoticed and that is really a testament to its success the most anyone probably saw of a raven was a brief blip on their sensors before it just zipped off. So it was really a testament to the success of the raven that it went unnoticed. It was not designed to be seen. You know, the Danios and the Vamalak, which are two ships that it was in service alongside, they were designed to be seen, at least to some extent. But this really was designed to be hidden. And so really, the, the Raven has only really been appreciated after the fact. You know, and on one level that's sad, but such is the fate of all great spy ships. You think of 20th century spy planes, and they weren't obviously known about at the time, but and they're still relatively obscure compared to their, you know, more combative counterparts. But they were still very, very important in shaping historical events, and it's only really later that they are truly appreciated. Yes, and arguably it really invented the idea of a scout class vessel in the Romulan fleet, which is as revolutionary as the Talis was a hundred years before it.